Hello everyone and welcome to our second module on stroke. In this video we're going to talk a lot about stroke localization which means using the patient's motor and sensory deficits to figure out which area of the brain has been affected by a stroke. And there's some terminology we use around stroke localization that's important to understand so let's go through that now. You can divide strokes up into two categories, those that affect the anterior circulation and those that affect the posterior circulation. The anterior circulation refers to areas of the brain that are perfused by the internal carotid artery. If you look down at this drawing at the bottom of the screen, the anterior circulation refers to the areas of the cortex that I'm marking with my pen, basically all of the cerebral cortex except for the posterior region in the back, which has the occipital lobe. On the right side of the screen is a drawing of the circle of Willis, and here's the internal carotid arteries. The two internal carotids feed blood into these areas shown right here, and that supplies blood to major areas of the cortex through the middle cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral artery. So when we say a patient has had an anterior circulation stroke, we mean a stroke in an area of the brain supplied by the anterior cerebral or middle cerebral artery, which basically refers to any part of the cerebral cortex except the posterior region. In contrast, the posterior circulation supplies blood to the brain stem and the cerebellum and the back of the cortex, which includes the occipital lobe. The blood supply to this region entirely derives from the vertebral artery and the basilar artery, which supply the back portion of the circle of Willis, including the posterior cerebral artery shown here. So basically any stroke that affects the brain stem or the cerebellum or the occipital lobe, these are all posterior circulation strokes in contrast with anterior circulation strokes. Another very important distinction in stroke localization is what's known as cortical versus subcortical signs. So the blood supply to the cerebral cortex comes from three vessels, the anterior cerebral artery, the middle cerebral artery, and the posterior cerebral artery. And so a cortical sign is a clinical finding in a patient that indicates ischemia of the cortex. And when these are present, it means one of these three vessels has to be the cause of the stroke. One of the most important cortical signs is preferential involvement of motor areas, and by this I mean motor weakness where the face is involved more than the legs, or the legs are involved more than the arms. This only occurs in cortical strokes because only in the cortex are the neurons for the face, legs, and arms separated in space. In other parts of the body, like the brain stem and the subcortex, the motor fibers all run together, so strokes tend to involve face, leg, and arms all equally. And so that's a subcortical sign, equal involvement of the face, legs, and arms. This indicates that the ischemia is not in the cortex. It's somewhere lower down in the subcortex or in the brainstem. The reason cortical strokes have preferential motor involvement of different areas of the body, like the face, arms, and legs, is because of what's known as the homunculus. This refers to the way that motor neurons are laid out in the cortex. So on the left side of the screen here, we have a drawing of the homunculus. This is a cross section looking through the cortex. The neurons that supply the leg and the feet are found over here. The neurons that supply the arm and hands are here. And the neurons that supply the face are here. So as you can imagine, if you have a stroke involving this area here, it's going to involve mostly the feet. Strokes in this area here are going to involve mostly the arms and legs. And in terms of blood supply, the anterior cerebral artery supplies the middle portion of the homunculus, the portion where you find mostly the legs and the feet. The middle cerebral artery supplies this portion over here where you find the face and the hands. And remember, the ACA and MCA are part of the anterior circulation. The posterior cerebral artery, which is part of the posterior circulation, supplies the back of the brain, and that's this section here, and that contains the occipital lobe, which is very important for vision. So PCA strokes tend to affect vision. Some other important cortical signs are shown on this slide. Strokes involving the left middle cerebral artery often cause aphasia, and that's because the speech center is in the left cortex in most patients. Strokes involving the right middle cerebral artery often cause hemineglect. This is what happens when you have a cortical infarct on the non-dominant side, which is the right side in most patients. Patients with hemineglect do not perceive half of their visual world. So if you ask them to draw a clock, it will look like this with half of the numbers missing. If you ask them to draw a flower, it will look like this with half of the flower not being drawn. And then homonymous hemianopsia is a visual problem where half of the visual field in each eye is missing. This is a cortical sign that you can see in middle cerebral artery strokes and also in posterior cerebral artery strokes. So now that we've gone through all that, let's talk about the three major cortical stroke syndromes. And the first one is the middle cerebral artery territory stroke. This is the most common territory of stroke. It involves portions of the frontal, parietal, and temporal lobes. 
It usually involves the area shown in blue on the CT scan on the screen. And MCA strokes lead to contralateral motor and sensory loss on the opposite side of the lesion, and the arm and face will be affected more than the leg, and that's because of the homunculus we just talked about. The paralysis that develops is a spastic upper motor neuron type of paralysis. And if the stroke is on the left side or the dominant side, that will lead to aphasia, as we already discussed. And if it's on the non-dominant or right side, that will lead to hemineglect. So this is a very common and classic cortical stroke syndrome, and it has all the cortical signs, preferential motor involvement, aphasia, and hemineglect. Patients with middle cerebral artery strokes can also develop a form of vision loss called homonymous hemianopsia. This refers to loss of half of the visual field in each eye. This occurs in MCA strokes because of damage to nerve fibers called visual radiations that run in the temporal and parietal lobes. Patients with MCA strokes develop facial droop, but it's usually lower facial droop that spares the forehead. The reason this is the case is because the upper face, including the forehead, has a dual upper motor nerve supply from both halves of the brain. So as shown in this picture here, you've got the homunculus portion of the face on both halves of the brain, contributing nerve fibers that connect to the facial motor nucleus in the pons, which innervates the face. The lower face, on the other hand, is only a single upper motor neuron supply. It's from the contralateral side. So what this means is when the MCA stroke damages half of the cortex, there will be only lower facial droop. The forehead will be spared because it has dual innervation, but not the lower face. And so this is the classic depiction of someone having an MCA stroke. Their forehead is not drooping, but their face is drooping on the lower half. Middle cerebral artery strokes are usually embolic, and the source of the embolism is often the carotid artery. And this should make sense to you based on what we talked about on the first slide in this video, which is that the internal carotid artery, shown here in this picture of the circle of Willis, supplies blood to the anterior portion of the circle of Willis, and that includes the middle cerebral artery. Anterior cerebral artery strokes are rare. They account for only about 2% of strokes. These strokes affect the medial cortex, the midline portion, and therefore, as we talked about earlier, there will be motor loss of the leg more than the arm because this is the ischemic area. The anterior cerebral artery also supplies the frontal lobe, so ischemia of that area can lead to cognitive deficits or confusion, and these patients often develop urinary incontinence as well. And there are many etiologies of ACA strokes, but these can also occur because of carotid artery disease because, once again, the carotid arteries supply the anterior circulation and the ACA is part of the anterior circulation. And then our final cortical stroke syndrome is a posterior cerebral artery territory stroke. As the name implies, the posterior cerebral artery supplies the posterior portions of the brain. This includes the occipital lobe, the medial temporal lobe, and sometimes the thalamus. The occipital lobe is where you find the visual cortex, and so if you take out half of your visual cortex from a stroke, that's going to cause homonymous hemianopsia, as shown in the slide here. It will be contralateral homonymous hemianopsia, meaning that the visual field loss is opposite the side with the lesion. And so homonymous hemianopsia can be seen in PCA strokes and also MCA strokes like we talked about before. In an MCA stroke, you have other cortical signs like aphasia, hemineglect, and preferential motor weakness. You do not see those things in a posterior cerebral artery stroke. And then sometimes a PCA stroke can infarct the thalamus. The thalamus is the processing station for all your sensory information from the body. So when there is a thalamic infarct, there will be complete contralateral sensory loss to all sensory modalities. There are lots of potential etiologies of PCA strokes, but one of the most important is atherosclerosis of the vertebral or basal arteries. And that should make sense to you because we talked about how the PCA here is part of the posterior circulation to the brain, and that posterior circulation derives from the vertebral arteries and the basal artery. Now we're going to talk about lacunar strokes, which are a type of subcortical stroke, so they will have none of the cortical signs we talked about earlier. Lacunar strokes occur in small branches of large vessels that supply the subcortex. These vessels often perfuse areas of the basal ganglia or subcortical neurons or sometimes the pons. And lacunar strokes are strongly associated with hypertension. These are a classic form of stroke that occurs in a patient with poorly controlled blood pressure. Lacunar strokes are diagnosed by CT scan or MRI. There will be a small non-cortical area of ischemia. If you look at the CT image on the screen, there are two small lacunar strokes circled in red. Note that they are not in the outer cortex region here, they are in the inner subcortical area. 
And the treatment for these strokes is the same as for other ischemic strokes, which I talk about in the first video on strokes. Thrombolysis is indicated in appropriate patients. And the underlying cause of lacunar strokes in many cases is believed to be a blood vessel process called lipohyalinosis. This is a form of vascular disease that is a little bit different from traditional atherosclerosis. That's why it's got a different name. And this is what is thought to occur on a pathologic level in the vessels that have lacunar strokes. Over 20 different subtypes of lacunar strokes have been described, but I've written the four most important ones on this slide. The most common type of lacunar stroke is a pure motor stroke. This involves paralysis of the face, arms, and legs all on one side of the body. And this occurs when there's a lacunar stroke that involves the posterior limb of the internal capsule. In the internal capsule, all motor fibers to all parts of the body, face, arm, and leg run together. And so when a lacunar stroke involves this area, that's going to lead to complete paralysis on one half of the body. And all parts of the body will be affected equally. You won't see preferential motor involvement like we talked about before because that only occurs in cortical strokes. In a pure sensory lacunar stroke, there's complete sensory loss on one side of the body, also affecting the face, arms, and legs. This occurs when there's a lacunar stroke that involves the thalamus. Ataxic hemiparesis is a less common type of lacunar stroke. As the name implies, patients with this form of lacunar stroke develop weakness and ataxia on one half of the body. This stroke syndrome has been associated with lacunar strokes involving either the internal capsule or the base of the pons. And then the final subtype is dysarthria clumsy hand syndrome. The name tells you everything you need to know about this. It involves dysarthria, which is difficulty speaking, and clumsiness, which is weakness of the hand. And this has also been associated with lacunar strokes involving the internal capsule or the base of the pons. So the classic presentation of lacunar stroke is going to be a patient with poorly controlled blood pressure who presents with signs and symptoms consistent with one of the lacunar subtypes. And remember, the pure motor subtype is the most common. Often the initial head CT can be negative and that's because these are smaller strokes and CT scans are less sensitive for small areas of ischemia. This is where MRI can be very helpful. Diffusion weighted MRI is a very powerful tool for picking up small areas of ischemia which cause a little bit of edema and MRI is often more sensitive for the diagnosis of lacunar strokes. Some patients who have a thalamic lacunar infarct go on to develop what's known as a thalamic pain syndrome. It's also sometimes called the dejerine russi syndrome. And when this happens, the initial sensory deficits from the lacunar infarct improve, but the patient is left with chronic burning pain on the contralateral side. This often develops weeks or months later after the stroke, and this can be very debilitating. It's a severe chronic pain syndrome. Let's talk briefly about brainstem strokes. The brainstem is supplied by the posterior circulation, so branches of the vertebral and basilar artery. And strokes in the brainstem lead to ipsilateral cranial nerve lesions and contralateral weakness of the arms and legs. And that's because motor fibers in the brainstem cross to supply motor innervation to the other half of the body in terms of the arms and legs. The diagnosis is made by CT or MRI, which will show a small non-cortical area of ischemia in the brainstem. And they're treated the same way as other ischemic strokes with thrombolysis in appropriate patients. And in our free sample section, we have the brainstem video for step one, in which I teach you the rule of fours to identify the location of brainstem strokes. It's one of our most popular step one videos, so watch that for a refresher on how to identify the location of brainstem strokes. Spinal cord strokes are a very rare form of infarction. They most commonly involve the anterior spinal artery. When there's a stroke of the anterior spinal artery, this leads to the sudden onset of paralysis below the lesion as well as loss of pain and temperature sensation below the lesion. Position and vibratory sense will be spared. That's because position and vibratory information runs in the posterior part of the spinal cord, which is not the area supplied by the anterior spinal artery. And I talk about spinal cord strokes in the video on spinal cord disorders. Let's talk about venous sinus thrombosis. This is a rare subtype of stroke. In this type of stroke, there's a blood clot in the dural venous sinus, which is the structure that drains blood from the central nervous system to the internal jugular vein. So when this occurs, blood will back up in the venous structures in the head. This type of thrombosis often happens in patients who have some form of hypercoagulable state. So this could be surgery or infection, it could be malignancy, or it could be an inherited hypercoagulable disorder. In actual practice, the presentation of venous sinus thrombosis is highly variable, but the most common symptom is headache. That's because there's a thrombosis preventing blood from draining from the skull, and therefore there's a buildup of pressure behind the thrombosis.
Usually the headache has a gradual onset over days. Very rarely it can be a sudden onset thunderclap headache, the type that is usually seen with subarachnoid hemorrhage. And venous sinus thrombosis can potentially raise the intracranial pressure, so you can see signs of increased ICP, including vomiting and papilledema. And I talk about elevated intracranial pressure in another video in detail. So in a patient with a venous sinus thrombosis, they're going to present with headache and signs of increased intracranial pressure. And in that circumstance, the first test to order is a head CT, because what you're going to be thinking about as a cause of the patient's headache and increased ICP is things like bleeding on the brain or a brain tumor. However, in a patient with a venous sinus thrombosis, you're not going to see any of those things. You may see edema, or the CT scan may even be normal or have nonspecific findings. So at that point, you'll have a patient with a headache and high ICP and maybe even a hypercoagulable state, and that's when you'll think of venous sinus thrombosis. And the test to order is called a venogram, either a CT or MR venogram. These tests involve putting dye into the venous system and then taking a picture of it by CT scan or MRI. And what you will see are filling defects where the dye does not fill the venous structures, and that's because of the presence of thrombus. And then once you've made the diagnosis, the treatment is with heparin and other anticoagulants. I'll finish this video by talking about a cavernous sinus thrombosis, but let's first talk about what the cavernous sinus is. It's a large collection of veins found between the temporal and sphenoid bones. This is a picture of what it looks like on the screen here, and you can see all these blue veins here found between the bones of the skull. It collects blood that is draining from the eye and parts of the cortex, and it drains into the internal jugular vein. Embedded within all these veins, you can find lots of nerves, as shown in this image here. You can find fibers of many cranial nerves and also sympathetic fibers. They're all traveling to the orbit. In addition, as you can see in the picture, a portion of the internal carotid artery is also embedded within the cavernous sinus. So a cavernous sinus thrombosis is a subtype of cerebral venous thrombosis. And just like we talked about before, when you have a thrombosis that obstructs venous drainage from the skull, that can lead to headache and raised intracranial pressure. In addition, because the veins in the cavernous sinus drain the eye, patients with a cavernous sinus thrombosis have prominent ocular signs. So they can have orbital pain, they can have proptosis, which is protrusion of the eye on one side. This is a picture of a woman with bilateral proptosis. Cavernous sinus thrombosis can cause chemosis, which is swelling, and it can also lead to ocular motor nerve palsies because the ocular motor nerve has fibers that run in the cavernous sinus. In addition, the patient can lose sensation to the V1 and V2 dermatomes of cranial nerve 5. These dermatomes include the forehead and the nose, and that's because these fibers also run in the cavernous sinus, and when it gets engorged and swollen with blood from an obstructing thrombosis, it can compress those nerves and they stop working. Cavernous sinus thrombosis often occurs in association with infection. In other words, the patient develops an infected blood clot, which is called a septic thrombosis. This usually occurs after a patient has had a facial infection and the infection spreads to involve the cavernous sinus and then a blood clot forms. So patients who have had facial abscesses or cellulitis or sinusitis or sometimes dental infections, these things can all lead to a cavernous sinus thrombosis. The majority of cases, two-thirds of cases, are associated with Staphylococcus aureus and it can be methicillin resistant. And this is a high yield sort of thing to know for your board exams. And the treatment involves treating both the thrombosis and the infection. So it requires heparin to thin the blood, antibiotics for the infection, and many cases require surgical drainage to clear out the bacteria. And that concludes our second video on stroke.